glory. Good morning. Good morning. Here I'm in my study one last time, perhaps. Um, today is Memorial Weekend, and of course the holiday tomorrow, Memorial Day, a day when we celebrate and remember the lives of those that were lost in the wars of this nation. Wars that were fought uh, largely, if not entirely, for the defense of the liberties that you and I enjoy, the freedoms that we have, particularly our freedom to assemble and to worship and uh, just to enjoy our relationship with the Lord. You know, I was looking at a video uh, tribute to soldiers who've laid down their lives, both men and women, young and old, through the years, who've paid the ultimate price that you and I can remain free. And uh, David Perry had posted it, and it was uh, particularly featuring a number of the flag draped coffins and loved ones um, pouring out their last moments of love and affection on their fallen heroes. And what a moving sight it was, and particularly as you would watch the young embrace the body and or the coffin of their mom or dad and realize what a special thing it is that God still moves patriots to be willing to lay down their life for the cause of freedom in this country. I'm ever so grateful that we have those who are still sensing the call and answering the call to serve their nation. And so as this Memorial Day is here upon us, I've put on what happens to be, I think, my favorite tie of my whole collection. And uh, those of you who know me know that I enjoy uh, my ties and give expression to lots of things that matter to me. I have a missions tie that uh, closely competes uh, with this tie for being my favorite in the collection. But I always proudly wear this tie at the appropriate times and even other times in between, just because I like it and I love this great country. I hope that you too love this great country and that you appreciate those who've laid down their lives for our freedoms. A few months ago, I attended a funeral for one of my cousins down in uh, Glenville, Georgia. And while I was there, one of the speakers was a former comrade in arms who had fought in Vietnam with my cousin. And I never knew or understood what a great hero my cousin had been to those that he served with. For because of his uh, bravery and courage, he was able to save a number of them in difficult situations. He had been a leader in his platoon and he was the kind of man that willingly risked his own life in order to preserve theirs. He would have never told those stories himself, but it was neat to hear his life and the sacrifice of it remembered by, by those who served with him. And so today is a good day to remember the sacrifice of those who served this great nation and paid the ultimate price. And so we do that even now in a word of prayer. Our Father, we remember those today on this Memorial Day of 2020, that there have been many who've gone before us, who lighted the way by laying down their lives on the battlefields. And Father, so many were willing and went and praise God they were able to return home. But many others died on the battlefield serving this great country. And we thank you and praise you, especially for the privilege that we have right now and seeing the challenges that are going on in our nation that is ever 
important for us to preserve our liberties and our freedom, especially that of the right to assemble and to praise your holy name. Father, I thank you for all those fathers and mothers who through the years have sacrificed their life in order to keep this great nation free and strong. We thank you and praise you that we've so often been led of you to use our strength and our liberties in order to defend the rights and the lives of others. I thank you indeed that this is indeed in so very many ways a virtuous nation, that it still is. And we thank you for all those through those years who risked their lives and indeed lost their lives for our sake. Fathers, I watched that video and even shared that later and reposted it that others might see uh, the depiction of the sacrifice that those families have made. I pray that today, that with heads held high in appreciation and uh, in honor of those who uh, courageously faced the enemy and paid the ultimate price, that we remember them and indeed commit ourselves that continually we will remember them and what they did for us. And Father, we'll not take our liberties for granted, but rather we'll continue to stand up for them and to fight for them against enemies uh, in high places, as well as those who think in this life to oppose us. Father, I pray that we'll continue to be a strong and a mighty nation, and that we'll use those liberties and freedoms one in order to continue to stand up for the cause of Christ and what he did for us, for indeed he laid it down for us as well. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' sweet and holy name. Amen. Amen. Wow. Indeed do, if you encounter those who are currently serving this great nation, indeed do honor them as heroes, as patriots. Be supportive, be loving, be thankful in Jesus' name. This morning we look at one Paul who was indeed uh, fighting for the lives of the Galatian Christians, whom he largely was responsible for their conversion and is deeply troubled by the temptations that they are facing. And some of them have backslidden or are very tempted to do so. And he's going to use some rather strong words. Sometimes believers, being of a gentle spirit and sort, particularly I suppose that might be true of the uh, ladies among us, but sadly, sometimes it's even true of the men among us that are perhaps too gentle and too soft and therefore can't seem to come up with the courage within themselves to resist the slide uh, where we have a tendency to backslide. We have a tendency to uh, be unable to face conflict or difficulty because we're just too nice, excuse me. But there were times when clearly Christ called a spade a spade and it was appropriate. There are times in Paul's life when he's very direct, uh, very strongly expresses himself. Today is one of those occasions. We remember that Jesus as well as Paul at times had a remarkable impatience or patience. Uh, and if there were a need for correction, was very gentle in the rebukes that he delivered. You may remember an occasion when Jesus encountered a woman at the well. And though that she had had a multiple of divorces and even then was living with a man in her life, he was not rough with her. He spoke truth and spoke fairly directly to her, but it was a gentle rebuke. The woman caught in adultery in the very act, same kind of response. 
Zacchaeus, who was still a dishonest tax collector, a wee little man, but making giant profits off of the backs of the people. Jesus went to have a meal with him. Before that, he had were invited himself actually to a meal. Before that, he had actually been saved. He was indeed loving and kind to Zacchaeus. But on the other hand, Jesus called the religious leaders of his day things like hypocrites, deceivers, blind guides, fools, corrupt and foul partners, serpents, that is snakes, vipers, poisonous snakes, vain worshipers, teaching the precepts of men. Whenever you and I make the mistake of teaching, espousing, buying into the precepts or the teachings of men in the place of God's word, if it were that Jesus were in to encounter us today, he would openly correct us, if not harshly rebuke us. He did that. Paul did that. And we're looking at just such an episode in his life today. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Galatians as we follow through in a orderly fashion and look at what Paul has to say to some of the leaders of his day, to false teachers, indeed to Judaizers. He's been dealing with them through this entire book of Galatians and he's nearing completion of this teaching. Uh, but he's not let up yet, and today he has the strongest words that he has said to them thus far. You were running well, he says in Galatians 5, verse 7. You were doing well. This is not a sprint. This is not a hundred-yard dash. It's a marathon. It's a long haul, and you were doing so well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Who pushed you out of your lane? Who caused you to pull up short? You've not crossed the finish line yet. The one who wants to win the prize has to finish the race, and that, according to the rules, you've got to follow what God has told you. You've got to follow what Jesus has laid down for you. This persuasion this new notion that you have and have been given by these false teachers, it didn't come from him who calls you. God is not the author, he's saying, of what you are being taught. You are being led astray. You are being led to turn back. God is not the author of it. What you are being taught, in essence, if he desired to say it stronger, he could say to them, you are being trained, you are being deceived out of the pit of hell. These things that you are being taught to do, to add to the crucifixion of Christ at the cross and the sufficiency of his blood to cover all of your sins, you are buying the lie. You are buying it hook, line, and sinker. And it is taking you down. Praise God, it cannot tear you out of the divine hold and grip of the Father. If you're genuinely been saved by him, he'll not let you go. But oh my goodness, how much difficulty it will cause you, how much stumbling it will bring about in your life. Again, I say to you, you were running so well. Who has troubled you? Who has hindered you? Who has messed up your performance on the track? Get back on. Get back in the race. He says to them in verse 9, and he's going to change. He'd been talking about life 
and comparing it to a race and their walk with Christ and comparing it to a race. And now he turns to the cooking world to draw yet another illustration. He says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. It only takes just a little bit that when you're making that up, you introduce that yeast uh, to the mix. And if you leave that for a short period of time, it begins to permeate the entire lump of dough. It takes a little bit to leaven the whole lump of dough, he says. But in verse 10, he comes back and expresses something. Now, I know that sometimes we can find some wrong in the body of Christ. We can find something uh, that we need to address and perhaps uh, have strong words uh, regarding, indeed, uh, a, a biblical rebuke uh, is in order. But he says to them, I have confidence in you. Now, these are folks who have gotten to a place that they've had, though they are believers and we presume genuine converts. They've had some difficulty or that they've apparently had some rather strong things uh, to say against Paul, uh, being critical of his appearance, being critical of the pattern of his preaching, that they uh, were not impressed with him as a, as a, as a preacher per se. Uh, but rather, he is still expressing, I'm confident that you're my brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I fight for you. I stand up for you. I pursue not for my gain, but for yours, that you might get back to the elementary teachings and principles of the gospel of the death, burial and resurrection of Christ that you get back before that you go any further. I'm confident in you in the Lord that you will adopt no other view that ultimately uh, that uh, my letter has been written to you, that you will not fall victim to the false teachers, that you will not embrace the teaching of circumcision for your salvation and all that goes with that, with the keeping of the whole law, that ultimately, you are in Christ and he's got a grip on you that simply will not let go. You will not adopt any other view for I've told you that if anybody else preaches any other gospel, which is really not good news at all, it's a false gospel, that if anybody, even including angels or myself, were to deliver another gospel to you, that you would have nothing to do with it and you would consider that one who preached such a thing accursed, that the curse of God was on their life and that you resultantly should have nothing to do with them or with their teaching, that indeed your response would be you would dis discard them from the fellowship of the church, that you would remove them from your midst. For if they are false teachers, if you're not careful, just as a little bit of leaven leavens a whole lump, their presence in the body will infect the whole body and that all of you will buy into their nonsense. All of you will buy into their teaching. And in time to come, you'll look back and realize what a horrendous mistake you have made. He says there, this little bit of leaven will mess up the whole shoot match, but the one who is deserving you will uh, bear his judgment, whoever he is. It's clear that Paul does not seem to know the particular identity of the one or the ones who are disturbing things at Galatia. And it matters not that he enter into a personal battle, it seems, with these particular ones, but rather he is satisfied to identify the generality of any person who would bring a false gospel, a false teaching to the people. And he's confident that ultimately the God of glory is the one who will settle the hash of this false teacher. Now he's warning the people, as for your part, you need to have nothing to do such, with such a one, but my confidence that you will make right decisions because you are in Christ 
My confidence is in the God of glory who's taking care of you and is going to lead you out and protect you. And he will bring judgment on this one who's been leading you astray. He says there, but I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? These false teachers have tried to claim that I am one of them, that I too teach and appreciate and even advocate that you would surrender yourselves, that you would yield yourselves to circumcision. Not for a moment, Paul is saying, do I advocate that you adopt a view that you are somehow more commendable or indeed that you are saved by circumcision for you are not. Circumcision is nothing in regards to your salvation and neither is uncircumcision. It is a mood point. It simply has no bearing on your salvation. It is what is you have what what have you done about what Christ did for you at the cross? Have you expressed your repentance for your sin in seeking his face and turning from your sin and asking for forgiveness? Have you indeed received it? Have you received the gift of faith with it? You've turned from any self efforts on your part in order to turn completely to Christ, placing your faith in what he did for you in his death, in his burial, for that's what you do with dead things. You bury them and you wanting to identify with his death. You say, I choose to be dead to my ways, to be dead to my sin, but alive to Christ Jesus. Now, when something has died, you best bury it before it stinks up the place. You put that old way to bed. You put that old way uh, to burial. You bury that old man in his ways of thinking and doing, and you take on the cause of Christ and the life of Christ and the spirit of Christ in you, the hope of glory, the one that enables you and strengthens you to get life right. He is saying to them, that's where you put your confidence. Why do they accuse me of preaching circumcision? And if indeed that's what I were doing, they would not be persecuting me. It's a lie. They told the lie in order to try to sucker you in, in order to try to deceive you. They are just what Jesus said of them. They are deceivers. They are serpents. They're vipers. And they're teaching a vain or empty teaching for their teaching is also a lie. It's the precepts of men and you will uh, not prosper under their teaching. If indeed you embrace it and follow it, don't go there. He says, in essence, I would not be suffering persecution at their hands if I were indeed teaching the same things they accuse now. You understand in an earlier occasion when Paul was dealing, he says, I become all things to all men that I might indeed save some. That he had encouraged his young protege, Timothy, to embrace or to allow that he would have been circumcised because they were ministering to a great degree in Jewish circles and it would make it easier for them if they knew and understood that Timothy had been circumcised. Well, they knew that Timothy's background, his mother was a Jewish, but his father was a Greek. And so the Jews would have a tendency to be reticent about Timothy's ministry. And so if they could submit themselves, not as an issue of salvation, but nearly uh, seeking to eliminate uh, the barrier. Now, that would seem to be in many of our eyes and our minds a compromise on Paul's part. 
And it is possible that the false teachers knew and understood this, and yet they threw it in Paul's face as saying, see there, he himself allows for that circumcision could be an appropriate uh, move on the part of believers. And so uh, you need to understand that you too need to embrace it. And so this is being thrown. This is the accusation that's being hurled at Paul. And he's quite adamant about it, quite resistant to it. In fact, when he gets to um, uh, verse 12, he's really going to say something about that. But look what he says in the last part of verse 11. Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. In other words, if I've taught that it's good and right and necessary for you to be circumcised, then the great offense of the cross and your salvation by placing your faith in one who was cursed and died upon a tree, as the Jews taught, then that offense has been removed and you can just embrace the law and you can embrace circumcision for your salvation and you need not trouble yourself about this one named Jesus who died on the cross for you so much and Paul is saying that's what they're teaching you they hate the cross they despise the shame that was endured there by this one named Jesus they can't stand the notion that their Messiah might have submitted himself to any such a heinous death and so the, in so doing in so teaching you to embrace circumcision they're also pointing you towards a disdain for the cross and a disdain for the shedding of blood of Christ there for you and so ultimately if you're going to follow their teaching you're more going to miss salvation altogether now, to those of you who have already been saved and placed your faith in Christ, he will not let you go. He will not turn his back on you. But make no mistake about it. If this teaching goes forward in the church, it will ultimately lead to the downfall of the church and the downfall of the walk of Christ in you uh, as you go with that. And so you cannot go there. Do not embrace what they're teaching. He says there in verse 12, I wish that those who are troubling you, who are crazed, creating difficulty, who are disturbing you, who are causing you to stumble, who are causing you to doubt, here's what I wish for them. And here's the strong words that the ladies may wince at and the men too, when you think about in reality, what's he really saying? I, I wish for them that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. I wish that when they were in the process of surrendering themselves to uh, circumcision and the cutting away of the foreskin of the outer flesh, I wish that there would be a slip of the doc's hand, that the scalpel, that the knife would indeed slip, and they might cut off the whole uh, privates. Uh, that is indeed strong language if that's the way it's been interpreted. Some of today's modern translations want to soften Paul's words. They want to think that is indeed too strong a language for the believer, but not so. If Jesus could say to those who had falsely taught and falsely led when that they come before him at the throne of judgment and they say to him but we prophesied in your name and we cast out demons in your name and we did this and we did that and he says to them depart from me I never knew you you were not of the household of faith, for you were trusting in yourself. You were trusting in your righteous deeds. You were trusting in your goodness. You were trusting in the things you had done for salvation, as opposed to your saying, 
I have a problem with sin and try as I might, I've not been able to leave my problem behind. I've sought to embrace the law and to live it fully, but it seems the harder I try, the further away from victory and success I get. And you throw up your hands and you say, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give, I will ever love and trust in him. I will ever in his presence daily live. I give up my pursuits of glory and I take hold of the only one good that is perfectly good, Jesus Christ. I place my faith in him and in him alone. I don't claim or cling to any righteousness of my own, but wholly lean on the sweet and precious name of Jesus for my salvation. Paul indeed was frustrated. Paul was angry and it comes out here. I want to tell you that there was a measure of anger and, 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 and toughness in the expressions of Christ when he would call the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees vipers poisonous snakes, when that they were the blind, teaching the blind. The ones that they were teaching had had no exposure and no setting free by the truth. And yet Christ was rebuking them for they were teaching them to be just like themselves, blind and deaf, unable to see and unable to hear the gospel. Paul is saying, don't let these false teachers come in and lead you to turn back and lead you to follow after them instead of following after Jesus. Paul had said, I was in that place and Christ lovingly broke in on my world one day on my trip to Damascus when I was going to in to defend the very same truths that the Judaizers are seeking to deceive you with, I was on my way to put a stop, if I could possibly physically, to the people who were in the way, that is, who had trusted Christ, and Christ lovingly broke in on my world and relieved me of my blindness and yet it's as if he's saying, I had to be struck blind in order to gain my sight. I had to be imprisoned in a world of darkness in order for me to cry out to the one whom I was persecuting. And I called on him and I yielded myself and I ever bear allegiance to him. You should do likewise. You get back to the elemental things of the gospel. You don't let the leaven of this notion that you have to be circumcised or keep the law to be saved. You don't let that leaven poison you or those around you. I remember a song in younger years called Bad Apple. Michael Jackson made it famous, as did Donny Osmond. And both of them in their younger days sang it and almost sound like twins. Well, I want to tell you what, whether you be black or white, red or yellow, it makes no difference. Salvation is in the way, the truth, and the life. And his name is Jesus. And any other teaching that you may encounter is false. Don't buy into it, not for a second. For just as a little leaven can leaven the whole lump, bad teaching can mess up the whole church. It can indeed put people on the wrong road while thinking that they're doing good, when in reality, their choice in so doing is an offense to the God of glory who was willing to lay down his life. And so they need to hear the truth and be set free by the truth. Amen. This is what Paul is dealing with. Oh, Galatians, who did hinder you? Who has caused you to think about turning back? Don't join them. 
they're going to face the judgment soon enough. But in the interim, you need to throw the suckers out. You need to get the false teachers out of the church. And if they're teaching the truth, but living falsely, that is not even living in accordance to the things they themselves are teaching, then just so their talk talks and their walk talks. But guess what? Their walk talks louder than their talk talks. So put them out. Do not have anything to do with one who is false, either in what they're saying or in what they're doing. For if they're not convicted enough of their own teaching and of the truth of Christ that they both talk it and walk it, then they're not to be followed. They're not to be trusted. They're not to be believed. And so Paul is dealing with all of this and he's crying out for them. You are running so good. Get back to the race. Get back to running the race according to the word of God and according to the God of the word. Chase after him. Follow after him with all your worth. And until he takes you out of here by death or he takes you out of here by rapture, you keep on keeping on doing what you were doing to the glory of God. Well, amen. I hope that you have indeed entered the race. Now look, there may come some times when you get tuckered out. And even if you have to walk, you keep moving forward until such time as you catch your breath and you rejoin the faster pace of running for the glory of God. Just keep on keeping on. <laughs> until he calls you home. Amen. The very one who called you into a relationship is calling you upward. <laughs> and he wants to give you a prize. Now, I know that we've already enjoyed being crowned by the forgiveness and the love of Christ in our salvation. Oh, but when we get the crown of life for eternity in glory and wonderfully and humbly we cast it at his feet then we pick that up placing it again only to repeat the worship at his feet it's going to be sweet you'll want to be there <laughs> and you'll want to see that others have the joy of being there with you amen speaking of being there with you next sunday morning May 31st, 1045, you be present at Second Baptist Church to enjoy the great time of worship we'll have there. We've been deprived of the liberty to go there for several weeks, and it's going to be precious to get back. You know, there might even be some of those who've made the mistake of absenting themselves for a while now who may chase, choose to get back with us. Invite them to do so and rejoice if they take you up on it. May we pray. Our Father, I pray that those who have heard this message this morning and yet have never given their lives to you, have never asked your forgiveness, even though it was provided for them at the cross and sufficient to cover the sin of all men of all time, except that they ask to be forgiven, except that they place their trust in you for their salvation. They'll never see glory. Father, I pray that even now, as we're praying this prayer, that they might be letting go and letting you come in, indeed inviting you to come in, and that they might know immediately the joy of having their sins forgiven and their uh, countenance uplifted and their face upturned towards glory. They might begin to look to you and the prize and the victory of winning in this life of recognizing that we're just passing through and how we run the race. In fact, that we even run the race at all matters for eternity. Help them to be set free even now. And Father, in advance, May 31st, 
We look forward. We're confident that date will arrive and we will assemble to give you the greatest and the sweetest praise that we've been able as a body, as a congregation in a long time. And may it be sweet. May it be treasured. And may we communicate that by our very presence. And then with our mouths, may we open up and let her fly to the glory of you. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' sweet name. Amen. Amen. Well, this evening, as uh, uh, we celebrate this holiday, and many of you will be with family, perhaps, uh, taking advantage of some of the greater liberties we're just now enjoying from the virus. Uh, perhaps you'll be out celebrating as well. I'll not bring another message this evening, but I will see you again by video on Wednesday. Glory. Go and have a great day. Amen.